Hey, think you know which way it's going to go? Make your bet at Sports Interaction. Whatever your sport, Sports Interaction has you covered pregame. Live betting on all major sports and, of course, prop bets. Who doesn't love those? Want to bet? Head to sportsinteraction.com slash SDPN. 19 plus. Please play responsibly. This is Agent Provocateur with Alan Walsh and Adam Wild. Powered by Sports Interaction. Want to bet? Welcome to another episode of Agent Provocateur. I'm Alan Walsh. I'm with Adam Wilde. With the infamous Adam Wilde. How are you, Adam? <laughs> I'm good, Alan. I'm drinking out of Steve's head today. Um, and uh, on, on my mug. Thrilled for this episode because it's the Alan Walsh Q&A episodes, which are some of my favorite. So we had over 100 questions asked. So you're going to have to sit and wow. answer every single one of them. <laughs> well, I've only got about an hour, so okay, let's, uh, okay. Let's see how far how far you get on that hundred. <laughs> so it's time to get time to get rolling with question one, and then this one I, I have actually always wondered, and I've talked to Jesse about it too. Okay, is Alan actually right. talking to someone on the phone in his picture on the title portion of this podcast, which is on the like the logo of the podcast? You know that very famous picture, legs up on the desk. Are you actually talking to someone? Or did you pose that photo with the phone in hand? Okay, so um, there was a photographer in my office taking some pictures. Mm-hmm. And while he was taking pictures of me, trying to, um, um, I was trying to act very dignified and agent-like, you know, sitting at my desk. I had a couple of photos with my arms folded. Uh the phone rang and it, it came through and I picked it up and they were still taking pictures. And then the pose you see with me with my feet up on the desk is the way I'm sitting when I'm usually talking on the phone. And so <laughs> the answer is, yes, I was talking on the phone with a client at the time. Although nowadays that that, that photo is quite old. I don't want to date how old it is, but (laughs) nowadays, um, I don't think a client would ever call my office line. You know, your, your office is basically, you know, your cell phone. I, I, um, there are times when if we take a pause recording this or we're waiting for a guest or, you know, we've been on the air for, you know, an hour or something like that. And Alan won't look at his phone for that little bit. And you can imagine the messages are piled up. And there's sometimes Alan, where you kind of, you, you look at your phone and you could just see your face go, oh, like something's happened, right? Did back in the day before caller display, so you didn't know who was calling, did picking up the phone ever sort of fill you with anxiety? Was there ever like, what am I in for? Pick it up. Okay. Tell me what's up. Uh, you You feel anxiety every time the phone rings, whether it's a... <laughs> You know, first of all, I never answer. I never answer an unknown caller, or uh, unless I see who it is, I I never ever answer. I think the last time I did was the time you called me when I was sitting on the beach uh, <laughs> back in July a couple of years ago, and uh, boy, have I regretted that. <laughs> uh, but no, seriously, um, I I I very rarely ever. I very rarely ever pick up a phone if I don't know who it is. Back in the day, there was dread. I, I mean, here's here's the deal, right? We're agents, but mm-hmm. really what we are is firemen, right? Because if you have a thriving business, let's say you represent, you know, like I do, 40 plus players in the National Hockey League. And a number of players, you know, playing in junior, you're advising some guys in college, players in Europe, just by the odds of the number of players you're working with on a daily basis, somebody is in crisis all the time. Mm. You know, it'll go from, you know, one day it could be this player. The next day it could be another player. Somebody could be dealing with an injury. Somebody could be dealing with not playing. Somebody could have a personal issue. But you're literally a fireman 
with a hose on your shoulder, running around, putting out fires. You don't feel like an agent. I mean, the actual act of negotiating contracts happens in a very tight window of time, usually in the off season. Sure, you do deals sometimes during the year, but they're much rarer than, you know, contracts once the season's over, contracts once you go into free agency, negotiating through up to a salary arbitration hearing, up to, you know, training camp. And that's basically it for negotiating contracts. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now comes the problem solving (laughs) and the putting out the fires. Okay. And that's what you're doing a majority of the time. So from now on, maybe we have to change the name from agent provocateur to fireman uh, provocateur (laughs) because it really feels during the season that the one thing you do more than anything else is put out fires. Right, right. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you just never know what's going to happen. And every day, very, very different from the last. And I'm sure that's part of the job that is exciting, Alan, but I'm, I'm sure there's days where you go, man, I just don't need this today. (laughs) <laughs> well, you, th- that's the stuff you don't control, right? right? And I try to focus on on the the things that I can control. Um, now, you know, w- what I've always done is I've made myself available to clients uh, and, and really anybody who needs to talk to me, whether it's a GM uh, or somebody else, like they know they can call me any time of the day or night. There's never a concern like, oh, I'm sorry to bother you on a Sunday or, uh, you know, gee, it's 1130 p.m. where you are. If you're on the West Coast, I hope I'm not disturbing you. People just call because they know, you know I'm always available. Right. There you, which I love. I love. So, Alan, I'm going to ask you a question and then I'm going to get to the question that at Smokes Indoors sent us, uh, which I'm sure is a, uh, a, 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 just, <laughs> it's a good name. Um, so, Alan. How would, and this is my question to set up the second question, how would your friends and family uh, and business associates, how would they describe you generally? How do you think they would if there was a focus group? Um, wow. Uh, someone who cares. Mm-hmm. Uh, someone who um, is is passionate about uh, the things that I'm, you know, I've always believed that um, your passions will find a way to find you, but you have to be open enough to receive that. And my entire life, I have followed my passions. So I've never felt really like I've worked a day in my life. I was passionate about being a prosecutor. I loved every minute of it. It was a very uh, important, formative time in my life. And I've loved every minute and feel uh, incredibly blessed uh, to be working as an agent in the hockey industry and sports industry. And, and I don't ever take any of that for granted. Um, but I also feel the weight of responsibility on my shoulders. Uh, and it's a heavy weight sometimes where people rely on you. People and their families rely on you to be your best and to do your job and to be there for them when they need you. And, and that's the key when they need you, you know, calling guys and saying, oh, you know, you're doing great, you know, great game here. Great. That's not me. Mm -hmm. Right. I I have, I I think much more substantive conversations with players and their families uh, than that kind of stuff. Um, But when players need somebody in their corner, when a player is going through a crisis, uh, that's when uh, they reach out and they need you. And, and I guess if people, you know, were around me were to describe me, it would be um, uh, empathetic, 
available and passionate uh, to see all clients thriving. I like that. And I'm glad that you used passionate because passion was actually the, the, the thing that was going to lead us into the next thing. Cause that's how I would describe you. If there was one word, passionate would be the one smokes and doors wanted to know this question specifically. What's the angriest and, and I'm going to say impassioned, I guess, angriest Alan has ever been with either a client or a GM. Can we get a heavily redacted retelling? Okay. Uh, let's, let's pick, let's pick client here. The okay. angriest I've ever been at a client. Um, I had a client drafted by an NHL team and, uh, and he was not present at the draft. And as most people know, uh, approximately one week after the draft, most teams have their summer development camp in their NHL city that lasts seven days. Mm -hmm. And the teams fly in to their city for the camp. All the players they've recently drafted, plus players they've drafted um, and may have signed even over the previous uh, two years or three years. So it's... it's Usually 40, 50 guys are, are at development camp. Some teams might go a little bit less. Some teams, you know, may go up to 40, 45, but somewhere in that, in that wheelhouse. And uh, this GM called me uh, after the draft to say how excited he was to draft this player and thinks they got a steal. They were following him throughout the rounds. And when they got to, the round where they had two picks because he was a little bit off the radar in his draft year. He was certainly going to be drafted, but more of a um, middle round guy than a top round guy, but a very intriguing prospect. So first thing the GM said, really want this player, really want this player coming to our development camp. Sure. That's, that's, that's basically a given, right? You know, you just assume he's 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 going to be there. So I call the player and and say, hey, I had a great talk with the GM. Uh, we got development camp coming up in in five days. They're going to send an air ticket to me. We're going to have all the arrangements. I'm going to forward everything to you, and you're going to fly into the city, and everything's going to be great. He says, yeah, sure, you know, no problem at all, and. Uh, uh, we come to the day he's supposed to fly. And I'm like, hey, just confirming, you've got the air ticket, you got all the information, you got the pickup information at, at the airport where you're flying into. He's like, yep, everything's all set, no problem at all. Great. I got a call from the GM the next day. Hey, Alan, uh, where's your guy? I go, what do you, what do you mean? Go, well, um, we had, you know, our crew out there to pick up three players who were arriving around the same time. And your guy didn't show up. Uh, they went to the counter and they wouldn't give any information. Where's your guy? Is he, is he, is he lost? Like we're concerned about him. And I'm like, I, I, I don't know. Um, I'll, I'll get back to you. So I call him. And he's not picking up. And I call his home and no one's picking up. And I start calling guys I represent in his age group, asking if they know where he is or how I can reach him. And somebody gave me his girlfriend's phone number. So now I call his girlfriend and she answered and I said, hey, um, it's Alan Walsh calling. I'm so-and-so's agent. Do you happen to know where he is? And she says, um, yeah, he's here. Uh, hold on. And he takes the phone. And I said, where the hell are you? You're supposed <laughs> is, to be. Is hell the, used, the word you used? In, or in was the it airport. The... <laughs> 
Okay, well, wait. He, <laughs> he, he tells me he's on a beach in Croatia. And I said, what the fuck are you doing on a beach in Croatia? And he's like, oh, I haven't skated in, in a while. And, you know, I, it, it's my summer. And I, I just, you know, my, my, my brothers were going to Croatia and driving. So uh, I just thought it'd be a good time for me and my girlfriend to go out and, and, and you know, spend a, a week on the beach in Croatia. And I absolutely lost my mind. I was like, you listen to me and you listen to me good. I'm going to tell the GM that you missed your flight. You're getting in your car and you're driving right fucking now back to your city. And you better be there tomorrow to get on that flight and fly to your NHL city. You better. And he's like, oh, I don't want to go. I was like, what do you mean you don't want to go? You just got drafted. By the NHL team, he goes. I'm I'm on the beach enjoying my vacation, and I'm not going. And I am screaming at him, like I don't think I've ever yelled like that at a client in my life ever. To the point where my I was home, and my wife was like, <laughs> "What the hell is going on with you?" <laughs> you know, the entire house was booming. Anyways. Reluctantly, he got in his car and with his girlfriend and one of his brothers drove, I don't know, like 11, 12 hours back home, grabbed his stuff, made the flight the next day, flew to his NHL city. And I just said, yeah, sorry, he, uh, he, he missed his flight. Um, you know, he'll let's rebook him tomorrow. He didn't really miss anything with the camp because they brought the guys from Europe in a day early to acclimate. Okay. Um, so he kind of got there in time to start. And right after the camp, they signed him to a three-year entry-level contract. And oh. he ended up having a long career in the NHL. Um, and it's something that we always laugh about with each other, about how... I, you know, he didn't really know me that well at the time. And here I was, this guy on the other end of the line, screaming at him. I mean, I, 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 may, I don't know. And I, I had totally lost it. But uh, he ended up going. He ended up doing well. He got an NHL contract and played in the NHL for many, many, many years. That's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> what a story. I, I uh, you know, I think there would be a lot of people that would have written that player off. Oh, he's lazy. Oh, he doesn't really want it. Sometimes you're just young and stupid, I think, right? Young and stupid. Young and stupid. <laughs> I'm sure you've dealt with some young and stupid in your day, Al. Um, uh, okay, so uh, I think um, the one I want to talk about next, and this is a, this is a fascinating one. Could Alan explain the differences in pressure – if there are any of a large court case, because Alan, you were a prod, uh, you were a sorry, I almost called you a broadcaster, a prosecutor in L.A. Uh, yes. versus contract negotiations on behalf of a star player who's in that, you know, 28, 29, 30 years old, going to make big money contract scenario. And, and, and so, you know, is there any difference between the courtroom? Are there similarities? How would you describe it? The greatest similarity and one of the, the, the greatest things I learned as a prosecutor was the importance of preparation. And uh, I have heard from many GMs over the years that some agents approach contract negotiations and they're not prepared. Mm. And uh, I, I would say, you know, I've been doing this now it's my 28th year. Going back to more towards the beginning of my career, I recall there being many NHL GMs who were not sufficiently prepared when they were negotiating contracts back in the 
um, mid to late nineties and, and early two thousands. But with the advent of the salary cap in 05 and the renewed importance on a team for every dollar spent and how it's allocated, it's become, this is no surprise to anybody, it's become much more of a science. Mm. And, and I find that um, there are, are some GMs who insist on handling negotiations with their NHL players on their own, mm-hmm. but they're, they have very competent, very qualified people around them uh, in the assistant GM space and analytics space that are feeding them um, a wide array of statistics, negotiation memos. They are well prepared. Um, there's very few GMs, if any, today that are just kind of winging it like happened back in the mid to late 90s. So the one thing I really learned as a, as a prosecutor, as a trial lawyer, was the importance of preparation to having a successful outcome. And I took that, uh, you know, I, I'm a little bit obsessive about preparation. And I have been accused by people around me of over-preparing as opposed to under-preparing for a negotiation. But I remember going in and and meeting with uh, a GM a number of years ago. And uh, the GM sat down with two assistant GMs and had three huge binders of documents and analysis. Uh, and it was a very substantial contract. And I had walked in with a briefcase. I opened it up and I took out my negotiation binder that was pretty, pretty big. And we were, you know, opening it and, and comparing, uh, different, um, different items over, uh, the platform year, which is the year just completed, or a uh, career to platform. And we were just having a general conversation about it. And uh, after about an hour, we took a break and we're kind of just sitting there, um, just talking with each other. And one of the assistant GMs in the room said, we had a meeting yesterday with an agent on a fairly significant player uh, whose contract was up. He walked in and uh, we had our, you know, we had all of our preparation, all our work done. And we presented a proposal to him and he sat there and listened, didn't take any notes at all. And then he reached into his suit jacket and he pulled out a Southwest, Southwest Airlines coffee stained napkin that he had jotted three or four notes down on the back of this coffee stained napkin. And that was the extent of his preparation. And then everybody started laughing in the room. Uh, (laughs) It's something I, it's something I never forgot. Wow. Now, have you ever been, and there's a few questions about negotiation. I think that comes with the territory, right? You know, everybody wants to know what's it like in the heat of the moment when you're negotiating, but, um, this question, which is from, and by the way, I, I should shout out the last person. Uh, that's Poppleton Pink that asked the last question. This next one is from Jordan Fortney at Fortney Jordan on uh, uh, Twitter. What kind of stats are used during negotiations? But Jordan specifically wanted to talk about contract arbitration. So when you're actually on, you're, you, you got an RFA, you can't come to an agreement with the team, you go to arbitration, which I hear it can be a nasty process. Uh, are they the basic kind of goals assist stats or are they advanced stats? You know, have, have those made their way in and where are they sourced from? And, and you know, what stats do you use to evaluate a player when you're in that position? Yeah, um, I, I, as we know, every NHL team has um, an extensive analytics department now, not just a person, but a department. And um, many of them use an outside vendor either to deliver stats uh, and analysis 
or they use their outside vendor to deliver the stats that they that they then process internally through some um, um, internal um, methods they've developed over the years. But you need to get the raw data from somewhere. Mm -hmm. And and every team is getting their data from some third party analytics group or company that assembles it. And there's a number of very good uh, companies out there doing uh, very similar things with some variance between them. Um, I've been to see all of them. I've had demonstrations. I've used them all. Um, and I'm very inquisitive about how each team, which is one of the most protected secrets in any NHL team, is you want to hear a GM or an assistant GM clam up on the spot, ask him how they go about processing and using analytics internally. Uh, I mean, you get crickets after that. No one talks about it. It is considered literally a state secret, right? Wow. So um, certainly uh, I have been a early proponent of analytics and I've used them extensively in contract negotiations. Uh, have they leaked into salary arbitration uh, to some extent? Uh, but keep in mind, um, I think over the last three years, the average number of arbitration filings in the summer, you know, num number in, in the 30s to 40s, and the actual number of filings that progress to a hearing is, is I, I think we've had one uh, or two actual hearings over the last three or four years, almost every case settles. Mm -hmm. Almost every case settles. And that's that's a more recent phenomenon. You know, go back 10 years and there was much more of a likelihood that a, a, a arbitration filing could actually end up going to a hearing. Uh, sometimes... In the past, I've had arbitrations settle as the hearing is getting started. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in one situation, um, we settled the arbitration right when the hearing ended. So we huh. put on the entire arbitration and right when it ended, we, we made a deal. Uh, there's been an amendment to the new CBA that most people are not aware of. And that is once the hearing commences, you cannot settle your case. Once oh. your hearing starts, it's going all the way and the arbitrators will issue a ruling and that ruling will be binding on both sides. You cannot um, midway through the hearing make a deal. Even if both sides come to an agreement too late, the moment the hearing starts, all offers are off the table and you cannot make a deal. And I think that that change was meant to further encourage um, deals as opposed to hearings. I see. Okay. As you always say, deadlines clear the mind, right? When you get down to that deadline, you just get the work, you just get it done. And both sides have to compromise and probably not be happy all the time. Right, Alan? Exactly. Now, everybody has to everybody has to put a little bit of wine a little bit of water in their wine mm -hmm. uh, when they're making those kinds of deals it's it's a completely different animal than a free agent contract which in its purest form is an auction to the highest bidder in its purest simplest form as opposed to arbitration where you really have to uh, be willing to show some flexibility and and yes there are different leverages that apply on each side mm -hmm. uh, and each case is different but everyone's going to have to put a little bit of water in their wine to to get that those deals over the finish line 
Um, West Hawk Nine wants to know, uh, and this question has to do with how teams are starting to attract players, especially bigger market teams. Are start, they're starting to attract players with money that doesn't necessarily come from the team. So the, this is something that the Leafs were rumored to have done years ago when Steven Stamkos became a free agent. Um, other teams have talked about this, but West Hawk Nine on Twitter wants to ask: Could this work? And and you don't. I'm going to name a specific player and a, a specific ownership group, but we're going to speak generally because Alan, we know that you can't speak directly to a specific situation in this in this case. But could this work? Ryan Reynolds becomes a part of the Senators' ownership. The Senators offer Tim Stutzla for his extension a five year. $25 million contract. So he gets $5 million a year from the Senators. But on the side, Ryan Reynolds company Aviation Gin signs him to a five-year, $2 million per year contract. So he is getting extra money. He's not having to pay the 30% escrow or whatever it is. It's a, it's a very high number. Um, and uh, the team can then go out and spend on other players. Is that allowed? Is that frowned upon? Are there any rules around that? So the escrow cap this year is 10%. So let's 10%. let's use real numbers. Escrow okay. cap this year is 10%. Um, and no, that's not allowed. It's a blatant cap circumvention. And if ever discovered, uh, would lead to a uh, drastic and draconian medieval sanctions against the club. Uh, you just can't do that. It would be okay. easy for... Every NHL owner who is every NHL owner is a billionaire. It's a fact. Mm -hmm. Look it up. Every NHL owner is a billionaire with multiple businesses besides the operation and, and, and management of their hockey team. And it would be easy for any owner to uh, uh, sign a player or player's family to mm -hmm. a consulting agreement or employment agreement that in some way would be uh, a way to supplement money to the player and or his family um, outside of the cap. It's a blatant cap circumvention and uh, cannot happen uh, and, and would be a scandal of epic proportions if ever uncovered and, uh, and, and, and made public. Okay. All right. I like that people are getting creative with it, though, because, you know, uh, you get around this hard cap any way we possibly can. Um, OK, so this is an interesting question from our email at. Sorry, you can go ask Alan Walsh at gmail.com. We've got the email set up. You can ask anytime. And this is from uh, Dove Sharnas. Now, Dove's got a, it's a bit of a longer question, but I'm going to I'm going to keep it a little bit um, shorter. And it re references something that you talked about with Jan Ruta when he was on. Uh, he, he said basically on that on that Jan Ruta episode, Alan mentioned how he and Ruta had picked Chicago to sign with after studying their depth and evaluating his chances of making the lineup. And this got me thinking: How would you approach a situation where you represent two free agent players who have similar skills to offer a team? But let's say, and and in this case, it could be two goalies, it could be two defensemen, two forwards. Where let's say if it's in a goalie situation, you know the goalies, one goalie is going to sign and be a backup. But if your other goalie signs with the same team, that could bounce your first goalie out of that spot. Or if it's a defenseman who's going to be a 5-6, and, and then that team signs another defenseman that could be a 5-6, it could bump your guy out, but you represent both. How do you manage that? So that's, that's a great question. Um, it is not technically a conflict of interest to represent multiple players um, in uh, the same position on a team or in free agency, the way that I handle those situations is, is like this. As an agent, you have a fiduciary obligation to each and every player you represent. And that means acting in their best interests. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's the definition of fiduciary obligation. So take a Yan Ruta example, because that's the question that was asked. I don't decide which players teams are interested in signing. Mm -hmm. The club decides. Okay. And then it's my job to negotiate the contract. 
-hmm. And if a player is receives an offer, I have an obligation to deliver the offer and I can give my advice. My advice cannot be colored by another player that I have on that team. And there have been several circumstances where multiple defensemen on the same team, I've represented them. And Mm -hmm. I don't decide who plays on the first pair, who plays on the second pair, who's scratched. I don't decide who's on the power play and who's not on the power play. I don't decide on their ultimate ice time or how they're used or who their, uh, their defensive partner is. Those are all decisions outside of an agent's control, outside of my control. But I negotiate the contract. What I believe is in total and full disclosure. So if I have a player who is a free agent contemplating signing with the team and another client has already signed with them, I'm going to call both guys and say, I just want to be totally upfront with you. You know, we did this deal and now the team is calling about this player. And if a deal happens, it happens, but I'm going to do what's in the best interest of this player now. And Mm -hmm. I guess, um, you know, one good example is uh, back in the day when Marc-Andre Fleury um, was in Pittsburgh uh, over the off season, the GM called me and said, uh, we're taking a real strong look at your other goalie client, Thomas Vokun. Um, How does Flower feel about having a goalie partner represented by the same agent? Mm-hmm. And how does Thomas Vokun feel about it? You know, and, You know, I didn't answer because I think the answer should come from the players, not from me. But I called both both players. Um, They had great respect for each other. They both said they didn't see any issues having me as their agent. Uh, Both goalies were comfortable, but we had that discussion. And and at the time, Flower had been in the league a number of years. Vokun was a, a a veteran goalie had been around. He knew that mm-hmm. um, I don't decide how many games he plays. I don't decide who he plays against and so forth. But what ended up happening, and and I guess it was fortuitous, is they became great friends with each other. <laughs> and having the same agent became w- just one small um, uh touch point in a friendship that developed between them of, of um, you know, Flower would go over when, when, when Vokey wasn't playing to the bench uh, on a uh, whistle and, you know, Hey, what do you think about uh, that last uh, sequence? And, and they would compare notes and support each other in a very positive, constructive way. And, and, and I remember one time talking to Voki and he said, look, every goalie wants to play. I can't lie. Uh, I, I enjoy playing and I don't enjoy sitting on the bench, but I absolutely love the guy and mm-hmm. it, it's my pleasure to support him and vice versa. You know, if Voki was playing, his biggest fan in the building was, was Flower. And uh, I think that's the way you you navigate and, and manage those situations by being upfront, being direct. Um, you know, you're not hiding anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it only really becomes a conflict if you're not disclosing it. But if right. if, if if everything is on the table, you, you know, I don't see there being an inherent conflict in what you're doing. Right. Right. Um. So that's it's it's fascinating to think about because that's that kind of, it's such a competitive sport, uh, very very tricky, very interesting. Um, uh, <laughs> Chris Chapman at Thousand Thought, 
Instead of a presidential debate every four years, can we get a Walsh v. Bettman salary cap debate? We think ratings would be through the roof. <laughs> what do you think, Alan? Would you be in for that? <laughs> All right. I challenge Gary Bettman at any time he wants to come on Agent Provocateur and mm -hmm. debate with me personally a salary heart, his triple hard cap salary cap versus a um, – a soft cap with luxury tax and meaningful revenue sharing. I'm <laughs> on. Let's 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 go. I'm sure he's just racing to the phone to go, Alan. Let's do it. <laughs> uh, yeah, something yeah. like that. Um. Uh. So. Um. I think there was a lot. There, there's a question here, and I'm just looking for it to make sure. Okay, I got it right. This is this is from uh, uh, Fishing Flynn. Uh, hey, Alan, love your podcast. It's been very interesting to hear hockey from uh, your perspective. Um, I have two questions for you. Do you ever see a point in time where the CHL-NHL agreement for players that are 19 years old be disbanded so that players uh, can go play in the AHL after being drafted? And I think this person specifically talking about North American players, because if you come over from Europe, you can go to the AHL. But if you come out of the CHL, it's either NHL or or you're going back down to junior. And a lot of teams don't like that, but it's something where, this, I believe, Alan, if I'm wrong, uh, the CHL wants to maintain some star power. Is that is that correct? They don't want to be rated every year. Yeah, that's a, a good way to put it. I, I, I think the, um, uh, the, 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 the biggest criminal fraud going on right now um, is that whole NHL-CHL agreement for various reasons, but here's here's one of them. The NHL pays a significant development fee to the CHL for every player drafted. Okay. Oh. Um, didn't know that. The, o the only the I mean that's how really that's how junior hockey has survived all these wow. years is through and 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 the first ever uh, development fee agreement was negotiated in the early 1970s um, hmm. between what was then the CAHA, Canadian Amateur Hockey Association, and the NHL. The CAHA uh, was the forerunner of the CHL, and and they were able to uh, get this agreement and, and get money for ostensibly hockey development. Okay. okay. But, but nowhere in this agreement – are we looking at the best interests of the player? So, yes, you're 100% correct. A player drafted from Europe, okay, is eligible to play in the American League as an 18-year-old. And a great example of that is um, our favorite big Czechia defenseman, David Juracek. <laughs> who started off in the American League as an 18-year-old this year, um, is a point-of-game defenseman and the second youngest uh, uh, player to ever be selected to play in the AHL All-Star Game. Okay? Hmm. It's been, I mean, he went to camp and the options were play in the NHL in Columbus, go to the American League, his CHL rights were owned by Spokane. Mm -hmm. We'll go back to Europe and play in a senior men's league, pro league in Europe. Those were the options on the table. Everyone decided the best place for him to start was Cleveland in the American Hockey League as an 18-year-old. It's a huge mm -hmm. jump. There are not many young players between the ages of 18 and 20 that um, would thrive – developmentally in the American Hockey League. So you wouldn't see the floodgates open and all of a sudden, you know, a hundred players playing in the American League uh, between the ages of 18 and 20. But, but with the CHL agreement, players drafted from the CHL are not allowed to be assigned to the American Hockey League. Even if it's the best place for them to be. Right. Okay. So, so take a case, take a case like Shane Wright, you mm -hmm. know, 
You can Just make an argument that. that a player like that, w- the best place for his development would be in Seattle's American Hockey League team for the year. Now, they they were allowed, based on him being scratched a certain number of games, to assign him to the American League on a conditioning loan for a maximum of two weeks. And you can do that one time per year. And um, you're still on technically the NHL roster. You're still part of the 23-man NHL roster when you're assigned on a conditioning loan to the American Hockey League. But they are prohibited under the CHL agreement to assign the player, Seattle is, to the American League for the year. But what if it's the best place for him to be mm-hmm. for his development, which should be the number one consideration over and above everything else? And the CHL will not allow it because it's like there are property. These I had it explained to me once like this. These players are our greatest asset. And we can't allow them to just slip through our fingers and go to the American League? We can't allow that. <laughs> and, and, and to me, like, why are we here? Mm-hmm. Why are you here? Why are we doing this? It's, it should be above any other consideration, the best interests of the player. So over the years, I've talked about fashioning some sort of an exception where every NHL team is allowed to assign one player to the American League in their junior eligibility years who are uh, drafted from the CHL, one player, and make it even narrower, one player who has to have been drafted in the first round, right? And you can only have one player at a time assigned to the American League. Open the window just a tiny little bit for those guys that are really too good to be in junior and and be challenged and mm-hmm. and and develop properly and not yet ready to play in the NHL and the American League is the perfect place for them to be. And every time I've talked about it, um, it's come back the CHL absolutely refuses to go there. They won't open the door even one iota. And, and to me, that is reprehensible because the only reason they exist is to develop players. And if mm-hmm. they're not focused on what's in the best interest of the players, I have no time for you. Now, Alan, what it's it's been floated and in, in Toronto we we got a taste of this with Austin Matthews, right? He went to Zurich uh for a year, made you know NHL money, made a million dollars and played uh, instead of playing junior. Yep. Is there is there a future where players start to do that more often? Because A, it pays, and the CHL doesn't, really. Uh, and B, you know, and I'm not talking about everybody. I'm talking about the best of the best. And B, it avoids a lot of these situations. Well, one of the primary reasons for doing that is to avoid any CHL team getting their clutches into the player and then either forcing the player into the NHL the next year before he's ready and, and having a player playing six, seven minutes a night being scratched half the time and Mm -hmm. how that impacts their development versus, you know, their best case scenario, having a elite player return to junior that they can play 30 minutes a game and build around and try to win uh, championships in the, in the CHL. Um, A lot of top prospects in Europe, are uh, trending towards going to um, leagues in Finland and Sweden and sometimes Switzerland because they're regarded as better development leagues that allow opportunity for younger players to come up 
and play with the men to play mm-hmm. on the senior team, right? Mm-hmm. So you'll have situations where 17 year olds are playing in a men's league. Uh, and if the player is ready to play at that level, it's it, it, you could make a very persuasive argument that if the player can play at that level, develop and excel, why isn't he allowed to play at that level? He can go to Europe and he can do it no problem, mm-hmm. right? So I'm surprised actually more players don't do that. But in Europe, um, for example, there are lots of of Czech players who go play in Finland mm-hmm. um, when they're 17 and who are developed there. Um, there's lots of players uh, from other parts of Europe that go to Finland and Sweden, um, Czech players, um, German players, uh who are looking for that opportunity to play with the men and get meaningful ice time. So it, it's definitely something to consider. Interesting. Cause it could happen more often. I guess there's nothing preventing it. The second half of their question is, has to do with an NHL fans ability to watch the games. Now, Alan, the thing that's kind of been making the rounds on the internet lately is people aren't convinced that um, <laughs> that executives who make these decisions are actually watching the games or are fans of the game themselves. Because if they were, they'd get frustrated by the th- same things we are. Uh, the second question here is, my question is something that affects me personally. Do the TV stations and the NHL, do you think they ever get rid of blackouts? I'm a Rangers fan. I live in Connecticut. And I literally cannot watch Rangers games on the ESPN app because of blackouts. It seems like such an odd and outdated concept considering we're living in the digital age where numbers and scale are everything. Thanks so much for reading. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I'm frustrated. Uh, You know, want to watch LA Kings game on the ESPN Plus app. And and if I'm based in LA – uh, I, I can't. I can't get the game. I get the. This game is blacked out in your region, and and there's been a lot of talk about that um, over the last couple of years. Um, you, you know the NHL package that you could purchase, for example, um, uh, Center Ice on uh, Directv, as as an example. There's so many games now missing from that package, right? Yeah that are exclusively on ESPN plus or Turner that you, 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 the the package is gutted and more expensive. So, right. um, It's, it's a, it's a rights fee issue. And I don't think that uh, you or me or any of the other fans, frustrated fans who get uh, this game is blacked out in your region are going to be able to solve anytime soon. (coughs) Pretty much what I expected, but it's a shame anyway. Now there's a couple of questions and there always is, as we get to it down towards the end of this show about uh, people that want to do what you do. And it's obviously not as glamorous as I think people make it seem, or it has been seen in the movies, but there is a question from a first year law student here. Alan James Dengate wants to know what advice would you give to a first year law student that is interested in player representation? Are there any specific classes I should be taking outside of the obvious labor, labor, excuse me, and an employment law classes? And also Sportsnet anchor Carly Agro has a, a similar question. She said, let's say you worked in sports broadcasting for a long time and you went with your gut and you went to law school and you had an interest in contract negotiations such as the CBA what's the best early experience? So not just the classes to take, but where to volunteer, where can I get experience on that sort of thing? Okay. So, um, the, the, the one, um, area of study in university that would probably be somewhat underserved with regard to wanting to be an agent in the future is psychology classes. And I would even um, venture into uh, social work, 
uh, dispute resolution, uh, mediation, um, uh, pers- you know, counseling, therapy, because really as an agent, you, you know, yes, labor management relations. And, you know, I've always been a big proponent of agents going to law school and being an attorney. I think it sets them apart from a lot of other agents out there. Um, there are many agents who are also lawyers and many agents who are not lawyers. And, and you know, I'm a lawyer. I have a personal bias. Um, right up front, I have mm-hmm. that bias. But I think having the legal background that I have and the legal training that I have has been immeasurably valuable to me over the course of my career. But if there's one thing I wished I had done was really delve into the human psyche more when I was in college, and that's psychology. Um, And I know in a lot of uh, 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 social work disciplines, there's um, a lot of uh, counseling and and individual therapy uh, classes that I, I, I would have been well served to have taken classes like that and, and been exposed to some of those issues because, you know, you deal as an agent with varied clientele, you deal with, you know, uh, human life issues like anxiety and depression and insecurities and um, people who are um, married and, and may be in a rough spot in their marriage and they reach out to you for advice and, uh, and they share with you what's going on. And you're, you're confronted every day um, with so many issues not directly related to playing the game of hockey and in professional athletes, their bodies are very much uh, fine tuned uh, based on uh, getting the proper sleep, uh, eating the right food, um, the right summer training. Uh, and, And this is all critical to their success because the difference between some of the best players in the NHL and some of the, um, uh, I would, in lack of a better term, the bottom players in the NHL, the variance from top to bottom is, is not great. It's very small. So then you look at what makes these elite guys, what makes them elite? 100% there's a talent factor involved that you can't teach, you can't train. It's, it's, it's God given. But once you get past that, right, how you take care of yourself, how you sleep, how you eat, how you train all goes into uh, a correlation of how successful the player ultimately is in in their career. It's all performance related. And I think it's critical uh, as an agent to, you don't always have the answers. And, and I tell players all the time, I'm not afraid to say, you ask a great question and I don't know the answer. But you know mm. what? You know what? We're going to go get the answer together. And I, I think I'm smart enough to say, okay, I don't know enough about this topic. And I'm going to go now and research it. And I'm going to find out who the best people are in this space. And I'm going to become an expert in that area. I'm going to pick up the phone and call them and get educated to the point where I feel comfortable giving advice. And it might be, hey, here's the top person, you know, regarding the question you asked, let's hop on the phone with him together and get some guidance here. And Mm -hmm. and your, your ego 
cannot be uh, so uh, uh, controlling that you're not afraid to admit to a client, I don't, I don't know the answer, but we're mm-hmm. going to find it together. Okay. I really like that, Alan. Uh, last question today. Uh, and by the way, psychology is a surprising thing. I would never have picked that out, but when you explain it like that, it makes a lot of sense. The last question, really easy one. And I think you're going to have to do some math on this. Are you ready? Uh, I'm ready. How many games professional and junior do you go to over the course of a season? Do you think? I would say in person, um, probably, uh, 60 games total, okay. but keep in mind, I've got, um, four screens at home. Uh, I've got four screens in the office and I could put two games on each screen and literally every day of the season, I have multiple games going on at the same time and I can put, American League games on a half screen with an NHL game. I can put a junior game on a screen with an American League game and an NHL game. Plus, there are there's software out there where you can one or two days after a game pull up uh, an entire sh- game of a player and watch all their shifts. Mm-hmm. So a player plays 18 minutes. I can go to the player's game from two days ago and and run all their shifts in succession without touching anything further and watch everything the player did on the ice in, in his last game. And I'm generally watching almost every client's shifts. Um, you know, early morning, I sit with my coffee, uh, drink two or three cups of coffee. And if I didn't see their game live, or watch it live. I'm watching all their shifts or a vast majority of their shifts a day or two later. And that's how I stay up to date on how players are playing. I genuinely enjoy following them. And and many times after watching a game, even if it's a day or two later by watching all their shifts together, I'm sending them some messages based on what I see and 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 having a a conversation so the players know i'm i'm in i'm involved i'm interested i care enough to go there and watch all their shifts and uh and and i think also gms know that when i'm talking to them about a player i know the player's strengths i know his weaknesses and i know how he's been playing recently and over the years, you build up that credibility with GMs where many of them have shared with me. You know, we've had Doug Armstrong on here as a guest and, and Ron Hextall on here as a guest. You know, I spend a lot of time with GMs and either on the phone or in person or having meals. And, and you know, they share with me, Alan, you know, I've, I've, I've got agents who've called in the past on a player and I could tell they they haven't seen the guy play in a year and, and they're, they just don't, they, I could tell by what they're saying. Mm -hmm. And, and when we get into a discussion, they don't know their player. And it's a great way to lose credibility fast by, by not knowing enough to be able to, and I think you're not doing your client any, any, any good service as well, uh, by, by not being up to date on everything that's going on. Wow. So it's a lot of time watching the game, huh? A lot of time watching hockey. (laughs) Well, listen, Alan, thank you for, uh, the last hour. I love these episodes because, um, I feel like people get to see you in the way that Jesse and I get to see you when we record these sorts of things. And, you know, we pepper you with questions all the time as well off the air. Uh, and it's, it's just, it's kind of cool to see kind of the inside of things. So thank you for your time. Love the thoughtful responses. And if you submitted a question, 
Thank you for submitting it. We obviously couldn't get to all of them. Like I said, we had over 100, uh, but really, really appreciate it. And uh, thanks so much for, for checking out the episode. This has been Agent Provocateur with Alan Walsh and Adam Wild, powered by Sports Interaction. Want to bet? Follow Alan Walsh on Twitter at Walsh A. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts by searching Agent Provocateur and hitting the subscribe button. YouTube.com slash SDPN. 